Just want to remind everybody that uh, this is a meeting. This meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. Uh, there is a time for public participation during the public comment portion of the meeting. On to administration reports, Mr. Wolontowski, Riverside. rate was 81% for the classroom. Um, our virtual program update, the goal for first trimester was 50%. We've exceeded that goal. Our first trimester um, completion rate was 67% um, and giving us an overall completion rate for Riverside of 75% for the first trimester. And then you'll see in each of the categories um, second trimester, third trimester, those goals increase. So obviously our targets increase. That's the kind of the school improvement goal that we have for Riverside um, that then becomes part of the 98B goal progress report for the district. Is there any questions about uh, that for Riverside? Okay, um, back to the rest of my report. Second trimester will end March 3rd, um, which is a Friday. Obviously then on Monday, March 6th, we will start our third and final trimester of the school year. Hard to believe it is going that fast. Um, counselors are currently working on finalizing testing rosters for the SAT, the PSAT, the work keys and MSTEP. That for us begins in April. So when we get back from spring break at the end of March, um, that testing calendar kind of up and goes. Um, and they are also conducting what we call senior audits. And it's just a, probably a third or fourth time that they've put eyes on the graduation worksheets for our seniors, make sure everything is up to date with those and make sure their schedules for the rest of the year match that progress in order to reach the ultimate goal of graduation. Uh, Mrs. Carson and I are working to um, finish the schedule for third trimester. Um, the TLC Reality Fair, which is a really fun activity for our students, is February 24th. It is a great hands-on hands financial activity that students participate in, setting up budgets, long-term financial goals. Um, they get kind of a career um, position and they they get to play with building a budget, a family budget through it. It's a pretty neat activity. It starts about 8 a.m. on the 24th. If you have an opportunity to come to something like that, um, I would encourage you to show up. I think, Keith, were you there last year for a little bit? Two years ago. Um, it's The kids really get into it and they really want to make sure that their budget ends in the black and not in the red. Um, and then, of course, enrollment of new students is, is continuing and is, is ongoing. Any questions for me? February 24th. And we'll start probably 8.15, but they'll start setting up at 8 a.m. Thank you. Uh, high school, Mr. Schroeder.
Good evening. I've also got Mr. Crow's report. He's uh, he's out with uh, the strep, so I am going to give his report first uh, for athletics. The winter sports seasons are quickly approaching the postseason as competitive cheer, wrestling, bowling, and girls basketball all complete in their respective state tournaments. Boys swimming and diving and boys basketball will take place early March. Spring practices will begin for all spring sports March 13th. Congratulations to our January Student Athlete of the Month. Sarah Merrick and Ethan Layton. Um, so going ahead and continuing with this mid-year report. <clears throat> so our mid-year report, our goal was at the mid-year for the high school is students successfully passed 90% of their courses in the first semester. So in the explanation, I kind of explain it a little bit. Um, there's seven courses. Every kid takes seven classes first semester. So if they fail one, it's 15%. So basically what we're talking about is 56 students in the high school did not meet the goal and pass all their classes. Um, the high school had 89% of students pass 100% of their classes. 95% uh, of students passed 85% of their, of their classes. So what that means is 95% of the students at the high school passed all their classes and or only failed one. So 6% failed one, 89% passed all. So it's kind of misleading as, as I just wanted to explain those a little bit more. Uh, so we're really focusing in on getting students to come to school, prepare, and, and be successful. The biggest problem we're seeing, and this has happened ever since COVID, is attendance. Attendance of students is really poor. Um, we we had 16 meetings with families. Mr. Crow and I, who was the dean of students, truancy officer for the district, 16 families last week, and 13 of those have been forwarded on to the Monroe County prosecutor because we just can't get them to come to school. The biggest challenge is getting kids to school. Once we get them there, we've got all the different things in place that they're going to be successful. We just have to get them there. Um, so we're going to refocus on this goal, hopefully jump up 1%, but we're really looking to jump up a lot more than that um, because failing one class, that's not acceptable but we're gonna do our best to try and get that closest to 100% as we can. Those students that fall be below that bar, we have summer school and we're gonna start talking to those students and getting those uh, students set up for summer school because our goal is to get every student to graduate in four years. We're not a five-year program, we're a four-year program to equip students to be successful, to go onto their post-secondary plan. And I work really well with Tom and Tom's amazing at creating different, um, we're creating programs that fit the students' needs and we're making sure they're successful. So uh, I look forward to working with Tom second semester as we continue to put these students in the right programs that they can reach their goals. Um, <clears throat> so with that, any questions about that? So really quickly, what are we doing now? Well, right now at the high school is one of the most busiest times. We are, we're building the master schedule for next year. It starts now. Not only do we have to ask every eighth grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, and 11th grader, what classes do they want? They should be talking with those with their parents. I also have to meet with all the surrounding districts because of all of our CTE courses. We create CTE courses and they're open to all districts or all districts in our county. So they can send students. So that means firefighter one and two, EMT, CAD, build construction, agri-science, and our whole business program is all open to other schools. So we have to work with them on schedule, transportation and all that. So that starts, it started about two weeks ago and it's really gonna be what we do. Those numbers that we get from other districts and from our own students is what drives our, our need, our staffing needs. And we start at the high school, we work staffing needs and then middle school and elementary. And then that develops what is our requirement for teachers in the district and what do we need to do to meet the students' needs. Pending any questions, it's all I have. Sure. So we've had uh, three meetings now. We have a rough, a rough plan, plan A, plan B, and it's all contingent upon how many kids want to utilize that. Um, so we have to find out what classes they want to take at another school. And then we have to figure out how do we, we already have the plan to get them there. We just have to make sure that we don't want to run empty buses because then we're just wasting money, right? So we're really waiting to see what is the number and the request and the need. And then we've got a plan in place to meet the need no matter what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'll start off, um, same with the 10... 4A document. 
Um, the middle school, what we've done is we use a test called the NWA. It's a Northwest Evaluation Association test. And we're, we just come across the board said, since it's an adaptive test, it adapts to where the students are at. So we're going 70% because that's considered the proficiency line for a district. So we went 70% across the board for reading and math, and that's grades six through eight. We used to take it three times a year. We used to take it uh, fall, winter, and spring. We've dropped that down to two times a year. We do uh, fall and spring, and we can do a screener test every two weeks if we need with the kids to see where they're at, kind of adapts and adjusts to them. The reason we backed off is because you have to remember we had PSAT, we have SAT, we had MSTEP. We have all these tests. We felt like we were just over-testing the kids, and it's really hard to get kids excited so to get true results, like to get them excited to take an NWA um, and to get actually true data from they have to really try, right? And if they think it doesn't matter, they're not going to try. So that's why we backed off the two tests. We do motivational things. We stand on our heads. We give them breakfast. We do anything we can to keep them, get them excited about that and um, hopefully get true data. And that's what we're doing with, with that. If there's any questions for that. Okay. What we're doing in the middle school currently, um, we have a blood drive, um, important. I, I just found out tonight that we have 10 open slots, 10 slots left. I'm assuming that after those 10 are filled, um, I would hope that they could probably open up more, figure something out. But that's a good thing. So 10 slots, if you're interested, um, it's Thursday, March 2nd, 2023, between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. right here in the Dundee Middle School cafeteria. We, we will have a poster. I have it in my hand here. Over there, we can post it and you can just use your QR code to scan it to register, or you can call 1 800 Red Cross, or you can go online and type in Dundee and it can come up. So, I, as you know, there's a high need for blood donations, and that's coming up here. We always like to give back. Uh, real quick, thank you to Desro Boys for moving the flagpole from kind of in between the middle school and the elementary. I was over in the corner, if everybody remembers. We actually got a bunch of calls, people like, Where'd the flagpole? The flag's not up. Well, actually, it was. We just moved it, and they didn't look to the left a little bit. So it's, it, they were super happy to hear that. It actually now looks like it belongs with our building. Um, and we didn't have to buy a new flagpole because originally, back when, they were talking about, hey, we can't move this thing. We're going to have to cut it down, cut it off, and put it in there. And those flagpoles are six to $10,000 because it's a big one. Um, that's real boys. <laughs> a couple slingshots, a front loader, and uh, some brave uh, brave kids. They dug it out. They moved it safely. They, they, and they, and they treated us very well. So now we're currently looking for concrete. Someone to maybe donate the work or labor or material to help with that, just to put a horseshoe around it because we have uh, students that put the flag up and bring the flag down every day. And I feel bad because they go out with nice shoes. They come back with muddy shoes. So, um, you know, Mr. Todd got some wood chips to put around there for now, but we really should have some concrete around there uh, to help them out. So thank you to the Desbro family. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences are this month, February 23rd, that's a Thursday, and February 28th, that's a Tuesday, so that's the 23rd and 28th. The sixth grade uh, families, they schedule them, so just kind of like the elementary, they'll call and schedule those conferences. It's not just an open house format. For seventh and eighth grade, it normally is in the cafeteria here, we disperse in a big horseshoe, and that's open house kind of format. So you can just come on in and meet with the teachers you need to meet with and go as you please. Uh, choir festival is Friday, March 3rd and 4th. Good luck to Miss Sinclair and all the kids. They're doing a great job. Uh, I, was, I had the pleasure to go to the Christmas concert and I get to sit in their classrooms often and they get to show off. They're, they're doing a nice job. So if anybody's interested in that. Um, and last thing for the middle school is tomorrow we have a Valentine's Day dance here. As you see the hearts, um, Miss Hope and the students in the art program, they're adding some decorations for the dance for tomorrow. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Leach and uh, Mr. Freshour. They agreed to do the dance off for the middle school dance tomorrow right here in this spot. And it will be recorded live for all those to see between Mr. the president of the board and the superintendent of the school. So I would like to in advance thank both of you for coming and doing the dance off for the students tomorrow. That's between uh, 530 and 7 p.m. It will be recorded live. <laughs> so any other questions beside the dance off uh, competition? Thank you. Have a great evening. Hello. Um, so I will also start with looking at the elementary school's goals and progress. Um, so we um, are similar to the middle school in that our third through fifth grade students also uh, use NWEA for our assessments for both math and reading. Um, and then our kindergarten.
through second grade students use AIMSWeb. We just feel it's more age appropriate for our students and the data that we uh, collect from that is more useful than what we would get from NWEA. Um, and so that's why there's that difference there. So our goal was looking at having our students make improvements um, on their proficiency from um, beginning to middle of year and then, of course, beginning to end of year um, on either their AIMSWeb or NWEA. And so as you can see, we're looking pretty good um, overall for all students. We are um, at 82% of our students at proficiency um, in reading and 89% in math. Um, and then as you scroll down, you'll be able to see the individual um, grade levels broken down there as well. Um, and some of them as high as 98% proficient in the, in the grade level um, there. So we're, we're excited um, to see those scores coming in at mid-year and to see that type of progress taking place. And we hope to just keep that momentum going um, into the second half of the year. So we'll update you on those scores again um, for end of year scores. All right. Um, and then looking at what we have going on right now at the elementary school. Um, actually, I just came from our very first um, advisory team meeting. Uh, we had 20 parents and um, community members um, reach out and express interest in coming and, and just learning more about what we have going on at the elementary school and also um, being able to, to have an opportunity um, to share um, some input and things as we move forward with decision making. Uh, so we were able to have 16 out of our 20 um, people attend and it was very a very um a very good time. I, I was very pleased with the questions and, and the input that we had um, for meeting number one and looking forward to the next one uh, in fourth quarter. Um, we have three classes who are going to be heading to Hampton Manor this week. They are going to be doing things like singing some songs and um, providing uh, little valentines and pictures that they made um, for the folks who stay at, there at Hampton Manor. Um, we also have Jim Basketball Jones coming on Wednesday, I believe it is, uh, and he is going to put on an anti-bullying and kindness assembly, um, and that actually goes along with the grant that we received through our peer-to-peer -peer initiative that we um, had a previous presentation on. Um, so this is just another piece uh, to that grant, um, and actually we're able to include Mr. Carner's sixth graders in that because he is so generous in letting us utilize his gym space uh, to fit all of our students in there. So uh, we're excited to have the sixth graders join us for that as well. We do have conferences coming up, our second round um, this Thursday. The, this round is um, uh, a little more specialized for any parents who either request a conference or um, teachers have requested a conference with the parents um, to share any types of concerns, either academically or behaviorally. Um, so we'll have those Thursday night. Um, right now we have our grade band students. Um, we're providing them an opportunity to um, partake in the uh, specials rotations. Currently, if you're a fifth grader and you're in band, you don't get to participate in art and PE, team sports, STEAM, science, and all of those um, other fun things. So um, we've worked with the, all of the specials teachers and the fifth grade teachers, and we put together a schedule, um, and we let the students pick um, a couple of classes that they would like to um, step into for two weeks at a time. So they'll each have an opportunity to experience two of those specials in addition to what they're doing in band. So, um, and then uh, those rotations will lead up to their prep work for their spring concert. So that'll be here before we know it. We do have um, a half day coming up where we are offering Viking camp for students. We've been having close to 100 students attend Viking camp um, the last of times, which is huge. Um, it's definitely a big undertaking, uh, keeping them busy for, <laughs> for the whole time. Um, but the high school kids who are helping to, to oversee that are doing a great job. Uh, DTE is going to be coming uh, in to give a presentation to our third, fourth, and fifth graders uh, coming up toward the end of the month. It's going to be on safety with electric lines and any down power lines and things like that. Uh, so they'll be giving a presentation on the playground for that. 
Um, and we are continuing the work of our peer-to-peer -peer Mr. Briggs' class. You may have seen some photos on our social media over the weekend. They just got back from holiday camp where they um, participated in a lot of team building activities um, outside of the building. And, and it, the photos are awesome. It's great to see the expressions on their faces and, and the hard work that they were doing there together. Very cool experience for them, and we'll continue working on that. We've got some smaller celebrations coming up and two more classrooms that we've um, been moving forward with in addition to Mr. Briggs's class that we presented on. Um, and then lastly, um, I presented on um, rocks. Um, one or two board meetings ago. And so I just uh, shared that with our um, fifth grade teachers as well as our advisory group that met this evening. And so next step will be um, putting that information out to fifth grade parents and, and offering them the opportunity to take a look at what it's all about. And then they can opt their um, fifth grade daughters in uh, to that program if they wish to do so. So looking forward to that. That's all I have for the elementary school. I also have um, Mrs. Plum's report, if that's okay to do now. Okay. So Mrs. Plum couldn't be here with us tonight, uh, but she shared the following things for me. Um, our GSRP section 98B mid-year goal is that children will connect numerals to five by name and connect each to counted objects. 50% of the children will meet or exceed developmental expectations in connecting numerals to quantities by the winter of uh, this year. Um, and as of checkpoint, 14 of the students attested Three students exceeded their expectations, while 11 met the expectations. Um, and uh, so that's 100% of the students meeting expectations there. The GSRP enrollment numbers have increased. They're up to 17 students from 14, uh, just one under our cap of 18. So we were very excited about that. Um, GSRP home visits are going to be taking place next week. The students will not have school while the home visits are being conducted because, of course, their teachers will be visiting them at home. Uh, and finally, a joint professional development opportunity will be held on Thursday the 23rd for Head Start, GSRP, Young Fives, and Kindergarten teachers, as well as some of our ISD staff who are part of our First 10 team. The professional development will focus on phonemic awareness and how it is taught at each level. Um, and I'm really proud of Mrs. Plum. She's heading that up and will be leading that professional development for our, our staff um, coming up here. So looking forward to that as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, moving on to the information informational items, uh, debit card purchases. Are there any questions on that? Okay. Uh, anything on budget versus expenditures? All right. <clears throat> Uh, the agenda to approve the February 13th, 2023 regular meeting agenda is presented. I need a motion in a second. Sure. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passed. Uh, consent agenda. Approval of the January 9th, 2023 regular meeting minutes, uh, January 21st, 2023 board workshop minutes, and approval of the general fund operational and internal accounts services. I need a motion in a second. Second. All right, is there any discussion? Long term and the Collins and Blah. So that's two different law firms. I didn't realize it was two different ones. I'm just curious of why we need two law firms. I can't say, have we always had two law? Probably three or four years. So the last three or four years we have. I don't know. There's one specialized in yeah, one thing. They handle different issues. 
Okay, just because I've seen where bigger schools than Dundee have one. So I'm just wondering why is there a need for two? I can look into that. I mean, uh, something that I inherited, so I'd have to look and see, right. you know, find out yes. if there is a need. I've always worked with Troon um, at my other position when I was at Vandercook Lake, so I can see if we can narrow that down or if there is a need for both. I'm, I know Monroe Public Schools, they just have Collins. They don't even have Troon. They just have one, mm -hmm. and that's a much bigger school district. So mm -hmm. just wondering why Dundee would need two. I will look into that. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Those opposed, say nay. Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passed. Public comment. All right, moving on to public comment. Uh, the purpose of the public comment is to provide an opportunity for a member of the public to speak. The role of the board is to listen attentively, and members of the board will not be responding at this time. The presiding officer will refer to questions to the superintendent for research and response, if necessary. Uh, if you would like a response from the superintendent or designee, you must provide contact information on the public comment sign-in sheet, phone number, email, and name, please. Uh, we thank you in advance for sharing your thoughts and ideas. All members of the public that speak during public comment will need to state their name, and we have designated up to five minutes per person. No member of the public shall distribute materials at the meeting without prior approval, and please contact the superintendent's office if you have any additional questions. Anyone for public comment? Hi, my name is Angie Snow. I'd like to first thank you for hearing our concerns and relocating the board meeting to a larger space. While not every board meeting is heavily attended, the larger space ensures enough seating while allowing a comfortable distance between community members. I'd like to also thank you for your commitment by showing up today. After last month's meeting, I don't think anyone have blamed you, would have blamed you for resigning as we have seen occur in neighboring districts, so thank you. I went back and forth on speaking today. I have had countless conversations with myself trying to find the best words to convey what is heavy on my mind and my heart. Ultimately, the thing that continued coming to the surface for me was what Dundee means to me compared to what it means to others. I keep hearing people talk about how it is their mission to preserve and protect Dundee's small town traditions and values, but given how deep my roots are here, I continue to be confused by what that means to them. I am a 1997 Dundee graduate who is married to a Dundee graduate, and together we are raising third generation Dundee Vikings. One is in the middle school and the other is in high school. And what I've been witnessing over the recent couple of years is not the Dundee that I know. The effort to preserve and protect any idea of what Dundee might mean to some has only resulted in division and a community being at war with one another. It's no secret that an attack on public education is happening all over our country. Sorry, I'm a little emotional. The actions that have been occurring in Dundee are predictable based on the trends we see from larger communities. The larger national organizations send marching orders to the grassroots organizations who in turn push them out to their followers on social media. That is not Dundee. That is outside communities pushing their agendas and inciting conflict in Dundee. There was an individual from Dearborn at the last board meeting that wore a body camera and shouted bold allegations at this board. While no one wants to take ownership for inviting the individual, they must take ownership for applauding him upon the con conclusion of his speech, as well as the accolades they shared on his social media. That is not Dundee. That is another outside entity pushing their agenda and inciting conflict in Dundee. Dundee is going to the grocery store and running into 10 people that you know. It's giving rides to other kids who might not even be in your own children's social circles simply because their adult was in a pinch and needed some help. It's showing up with meals when you learn someone has fallen ill. It's ties to many of the local families based on years of history shared. It's running the neighbor kids to school because they missed the bus. It's cheering loudly for other people's kids on the team when their adult is not able to make a game and snapping a couple of photos or videos to share with them later on. It's the farmer's market, holiday parades, bonfires, and the Mayfly Festival. 
It's being able to go for a walk and feel safe. That is what Small Town Dundee means to me. It would be unfair of me not to acknowledge that there are others in the community pursuing some progressive actions. I am one of them. For me, progress is inevitable and necessary. As a human population, we are constantly striving for ways in which we can learn from data and history to be more efficient and effective. We see this happen in our jobs, in our homes, and we should be seeing it in our public school systems as the population that it serves continues to change. I believe we can retain the small town Dundee vibe that I've always known and loved while also embracing some level of progress that serves the current population of the district. I recognize that not everyone in Dundee is ready for too much to happen too fast, but recognizing that some progress is needed while also respecting that it might be too much for some is called a compromise. As a board, you will never find a one-size-fits-all solution no matter the topic, but I choose to believe we can find a common ground and coexist in a gray space that fits most of the community. I acknowledge that my words may not resonate with, with all the people in this room, and that's okay. I am not perfect, and I certainly do not have all the answers. My hope in speaking is that I might reach just one person who will move forward, giving some pause to their words and actions, which will in turn create a positive domino effect. We cannot continue to be so firmly rooted in our own convictions that we dehumanize our neighbors. Lastly, speaking of spreading kindness and positivity, I would like to highlight that there is a teacher appreciation post on the Dundee Viking page, asking for markers, crayons, colored pencils, number two pencils, tissues, all the good stuff. Teachers are running low. Um, and so they've also posted Amazon wish lists in the comment sections, and I would just encourage everybody to check those out. If you want to donate, you can uh, send it in with your student or drop it off at the respective office. Thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Jen Kiefer, um, parent of elementary school students and um, pastor. Respect, ownership, and wise choices. As you know, these are the values that we aim to teach the children who walk into the halls of Dundee Community Schools. As a parent, I am grateful for the focus on these values, which are values that myself and my husband have hoped to instill in our children at home. It is our feeling that the values of respect, ownership and wise choices are the stepping stones which will lead our children to become responsible citizens and kind neighbors, especially in our small town. Ultimately, I believe these three values are excellent small town values which all of us, old and young, should seek to embody. For in small towns, we really get to know each other. In small towns, lifelong friends fill each other's freezers when someone has become ill or died. We get to know the folks in the grocery store and we get to know the clerks by name and who they are. If you're a regular at one of the restaurants in town, the servers know what you're gonna order when you walk in the door. And we feed each other, pass on clothes and gently use sporting goods and we show up for each other. And we are able to do this because we are in relationship with one another and have come to respect each other and, can, and are committed to treating each other with dignity. I know that not everyone in this room is a person of faith, but as a person of faith myself, I define small town values as living into the greatest commandments of loving God and loving neighbor. Taking this a step further for myself and for those who follow Christ, we are commanded to love one another as Christ first loved us. In the Gospel of John, he says, by this everyone know, will know you are my disciples if you love one another. As a whole, for a community made up of people of many faith traditions or none at all, one thing we do pretty well is leaning into love. You do it very well here in the Dundee Community Schools where our teachers and staff are dedicated to providing an excellent education and seeking out the best ways to support our children so that all of them can have the best chance at success after they leave the halls of these schools. As I have said in previous meetings, but I, it bears repeating, my husband and I are beyond grateful for the care and concern that both of our children have received in the elementary school. 
We couldn't ask for better teachers, better staff and administration than we have experienced at the elementary school. And so it caused me great concern to witness the events of the last board meeting when there was lots of anger and false truths and horrific accusations, generally unkind words spoken. That brought up such an air of tension that when I went to pick up my daughter from wrestling practice, I could not bring her back. I had to take her home because I refused to expose her to what was going on. These board meetings should be places where we live out the model of our schools, students first, and respect ownership and wise choices. You should not have to endure what you endured last month. These meetings should be places where we have good constructive dialogue and we model the values of respect, ownership, and wise choices while encouraging our children to be a part of the decision-making process so that they can see how we move forward in ways that build up community even when we disagree instead of tearing it down and trying to intimidate others into fear and complacency. And our schools should be places where all of our children are seen and valued for who they are and the gifts they bring to the table. None of them should have to feel like they have to hide who they are. And school should be a safe place where they can be their genuine selves. So that they can truly learn to respect each other's differences, to take ownership when they make mistakes, and where they are encouraged to learn from these mistakes so that they can make wise choices in the future. Thank you. Hi again. My name is Ashley Boatman. There's a lot of negative that I could focus on today, but I'm going to try to focus on more good than bad. As I have stated before, my husband and I both attended Dundee, and our children are fifth generation Vikings. I have expressed my frustration previously with the verbal attacks that, have, that I have been hearing take place against our district. While last month's board meeting was definitely something of what I would call a deliberate spectacle, Many of the board meetings for the last three years have been full of something similar, which is why I started attending these meetings to express the love and appreciation that I have for this district. But I have always had to show up, but I have also had to show up to advocate for things that benefit my children and arguably all students in this district, but that a small group of people are against because of a national movement that feeds on and takes advantage of people's grievances in order to diminish public education. While I could force focus on grievances of my own that I have had in the past, I have chosen to focus on the good and defend my community and this dis district because this community and Dundee's educa educators are in large part what has shaped who I am today. I want to share why I show up to defend this district. I became a mom at the age of 17. And I had a small baby at home as I went through my senior year here at Dundee. I had teachers who definitely treated me differently but I had many more that continued to treat me and see me as a person who still had value. Many who made sure to give me subtle encouragement that I was smart and capable. Even to this day, I have educators, educators who are not only supporting my children and cheering them on, but also still doing the same for me. There are many in this district that are often a venting ear, a kind word, and an understanding heart. Despite having graduated over a decade ago, Dundee teachers are still helping me and my family. This past December, I graduated cum laude from Central Michigan University with my bachelor's degree. I worked my butt off, and I completed 87 credits in a little over a year and a half. Interesting fact, less than 2% of teen parents will complete their bachelor's degree before the age of 30. I did. This is why I have been here and will continue to show up for my children, my district, my community, and what small town values means to me. For me, small towns lift each other up. I have connected with some pretty amazing people over the last couple of years because of the concerns we had following some of these board meetings. Perfect strangers who I talk to now almost daily. People who help with last minute school pickups, check in about new jobs or how our child is adjusting to the new school year. 
They have become friend, friends who drop off gifts and flowers on my doorstep just because I needed an emotional pick-me-up. They are friends who text me, texted me a couple weeks ago asking if I needed help to blow up balloons or help make a cake for my youngest sixth birthday party that was a couple weeks ago. I have honestly learned to appreciate small towns even more through these last couple of trying years. I tell my story to you and my experiences because I want to give kudos to all the educators in this room and that may be listening to this. I want, to know, want them to know that despite all the noise, I'm standing here as proof of the profound impact that even one educator can have on a child's life. I want to give kudos to the people who embody the value of small towns. I want all that I had and more for my children. If these verbal attacks and harmful rhetoric on our educators and our staff continue, I fear the amazing educators Dundee may lose because of it. So now I call on you, the board. It is well past time to say enough is enough and defend our district and all students against the toxicity that has been plaguing our community. As a voter and as a parent, that is the job that I elected you to do. Support our district and support all students, not some of them. It is well past time to stop allowing hate and vitriol to tear this community down. It is, a school, it is school boards all across the country right now who stand between every student's right to a free public education and those who want to see public education eradicated. You have a lot of weight on your shoulders and I do not envy you, but I trust that many of you will do what is right. Christy Rogers, I was not going to speak today, so I'm going to sound like a rambling idiot, just so you know, but that's okay. I just want to come up here first and tell you guys all thank you very much for everything you do. I know in working a little bit that I do with the children, it can be absolutely exhausting, especially when you have a kid that may be a little bit ungrateful, and then, then you have the parents, when you talk to them, also be ungrateful versus helping you out to fix the problem. So thank you for being here, because I'm telling you I would be devastated if some of these teachers left because there's one sitting here today that when my son went skiing last week and the first thing he said was, send a picture to Mrs. Bearden. <laughs> not to grandma, not to grandpa, to Mrs. Bearden. And the same thing with my son Virgil to Mrs. Zanger. Um, so small town community. I can't tell you what generation I am. I'm pretty sure my great, great grandma probably laid the first brick. <laughs> so I get it. Um, I'm ashamed of what I'm about to say. I was a very close-minded person. And it wasn't until I adopted my niece, who is very open and caring, to open my eyes. And I'm crying because I'm ashamed to say that if a child walked up to me as a teenager and said, I'm a girl, but I want to be a boy, I would be like, oh my God, that's, that's disgusting, that's horrible. And it wasn't until I woke up, I put the I know everything in my back pocket, and I sat and I listened to adults and children to learn geez, Christy, what's the matter with you? Why does how you feel really matter to that person? If that person is happy, especially a child, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. If calling little Jimmy Susie Q makes that child happy and not want to harm themselves, call the kid Susie Q. And I know there's been repercussions on how things were handled last year. And I heard Mr. Leach, I was not at the board meeting, um, ask, please give us time to fix this. As an adult who deals with kids on many different levels, not just here at the school, I can tell you it is not as easy as having little Susie Q come up to you and say, Mrs. Rogers, I need to tell my mom and dad that I want to be a boy, and I want you to call me Jimmy. It is not that easy for that child to go home because my daughter has one of those friends who came to my home years ago and said, please, when my mom gets here, call me by my given name. And as a mom... I was like, I can't keep that from your mother. I can't do that. But seeing that pain in that child's eyes, there was a reason they wanted that to be quiet. And it wasn't until I talked to this individual child that I found out because she didn't feel safe talking to her parents because she didn't know how they would react. They didn't know how they would take it. Would she be harmed mentally and physically because of things the dad has said? And my husband's guilty of saying these horrible things too. So yeah, like I said, I'm ashamed of it but I've opened my eyes to realize that this is all new. So there definitely has to be something in place for the school to sit down with the student and say, why can't you talk to your parents? How can we help you? And then bring a professional and maybe to sit down with the parents, get the parents to understand it's about a child's mental health. And maybe they will grow up one day and be a regular male or female. 
I do, however, still have some of my old roots to where you have to find the happy norm because this is all new. Just like when segregation was new, we all had to learn to deal with it. When interracial couples was new, it was frowned upon and you can't do that. A white person can't marry a black person. Oh, absolutely not. But we learn to deal with it. We learn how to cope with it per se and everybody was fine with it. And this whole transgender thing is new. Nobody knows how to handle it. So the school board has to find and the school to find the happy medium for everybody. Because at the same token, it is not fair for somebody's child who is a female wanting to go in the mail to be uncomfortable to use their designated sex they were born with to use. It's also not fair for my child to share that. I'm rambling now, so I'm just going to shut up. But you get what I'm trying to say. You have to find the happy norm to fix everybody. And I'm asking the public to be patient and understand that everybody's trying to make everybody comfortable and come together and work together. I know you're more than willing to work with people to so everybody. Just work together and be happy. That's it. Anyone else for public comment? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Jordan Siegert. I'm a parent of a student and a home and business owner in Dundee, which is important because I'm from Dundee. We've had a lot of people that sometimes speak at different boards around the country, not from their school. So I think it's important and state that we're, a lot of us here are mostly from Dundee. I'm sure actually most of us are from Dundee here. So that's very important to be involved. Um, my daughter is in elementary school. She is learning to craft sentences right now and make cohesive and concise stories. So I'm going to do my best to do that as well because she's trying to teach me a lesson. So, um, Mr. Leach, welcome to Dundee. Thank you for uh, for being here. Last week, your comments, much appreciated. Um, you said, you know, striking the balance, finding that middle ground. We we need that in Dundee. There's a diverse uh, group of people, becoming more, more diverse as time goes on. So thank you for helping us find middle ground. Um, to the board, thanks for finding time to serve and serving. It's, uh, I, I often picture myself as a board member, what that would mean and what that would look like. And it's often a difficult thought train to go down because it seems very difficult. And as a business owner, I am tasked with running a business. It involves labor costs and overhead and expansion plans and workplace harmony. And this sounds a lot like a school. So when I listen to meetings, the comment period is often so focused on a narrow set of ideas that I get concerned. We have a budget to run. We have facilities projects to monitor. We have curriculum to choose, teachers to hire. So I, I do hope that the board, as, as you know, as a board, um, just just know that there's a lot of concerns that the parents are not speaking and, and bringing up. Um, it can be very narrow in the, in the comment time. And when I look at the board, I am thankful. There's a pretty nice diversity in the board. We have you know legal knowledge and construction knowledge and parent knowledge. So that's good. And I, I do hope that each of your... Uh, you know, passions and the focus, uh, the areas that you focus on, that's, we need that, we need that value, uh, we need the input, but we also need uh, a diversity of thoughts as well up there, and we need to be thinking about just more than our main passions. And I want to quickly shift gears to one separate topic. Um, this has been concerning me for a couple of years now. My, um, I, I keep hearing from people, and this is, you hear on community, here nationwide, you hear that teachers should just stick to the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And this baffles me. My daughter went through a difficult time recently. Uh, she used the services of the school counselor and it was fantastic. Uh, during one of the school COVID years that we had, she learned breathing exercises among other life skills. And these often they were done at the beginning of class time. And she would come home and she would tell us what she had learned. And we were able to, uh, with those skills she learned, utilize those on our own house. And that was very valuable. And that is not reading, writing or arithmetic, but it was fantastically valuable. It's emotional intelligence, and we need we need that part of intelligence also to be taught from our you know in the school. I entrust my my child to the school's care for seven hours a day. That's a lot of time. I want my child to be intelligent, um, but again, the emotional intelligence. I go back to that, and I want her to learn how to play soccer during the team sports specials that she's doing now. I want to see her how 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 adults should behave. 
Uh, she can see a good view of that during school. I'm thankful for that. I want to learn how, how she, I, want, I want her to learn how she can talk to other students because eventually she'll be talking to other grown adults when she's in the real world. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. These are skills that will pay dividends long after a school is over. So I ask you as, as a board, please continue to help my daughter and all students to be the best student and the best person they can be. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Okay, thank you, all that spoke. All right, going on to new business. Uh, the athletic overnight trips. Uh, we have to approve or to approve the following athletic overnight trips as requested. Wrestling individual regionals, February 17th through 18th. Richmond High School, Richmond, Michigan. Uh, parent transport. Wrestling team finals, February 24th through 25th at the Wings Event Center, Kalamazoo, Michigan, District Transport, and Wrestling Individual Finals, March 3rd through the 4th at Ford Field, Detroit, Michigan, Parent Transport, Boy Swim and Dive, MHSAA Finals, March 10th through 11th, Oakland University, Auburn Hills, Michigan, Parent Transport. I need a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Okay, opposed nay. Motion passed. Uh, teacher extended leave. To approve the extended leave for the DCS teacher as presented through the end of the 2022-2023 school year with the expectation that the teacher will return for the 2023 through 2024 school year. I need a motion and a second. Support. Any discussion? All right, uh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. Motion passes. Paraprofessional resignation. To accept the resignation of Angela Swanson, middle school paraprofessional effective uh, 116 of 23. I need a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. Motion passed. <clears throat> Puerto Rico trip request to authorize the high school Spanish club to take a trip to Puerto Rico from March 10th, 2024 to March 16th, 2024, utilizing Veminist Tours. Uh, I'll need a motion and a second. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, we do have some discussion. Yeah, before we do vote on this, uh, we have a presentation to show, so. Do you have the PowerPoint? Tom, do you wanna do you wanna Thank you. 
So as of right now, we're planning the third week of March. And the reason that we picked that week historically is it falls between um, winter sports seasons and the beginning of spring sports seasons. Also, it does not conflict with um, spring break. I do not want to take the kids to a tropical island during spring break. I don't think that's a great idea. Um, plus, the island's just crazy. Um, there's, it's too packed. So um, we would travel approximately the third week of March. Right now, I have uh, 43 signed up that are interested and approximately 10 parents that are interested in chaperoning. Um, Nancy Charbonneau is my right-hand woman, so she and I will be uh, the staff. Um, Can I ask a question real sure. quick, inquiring minds? Uh, do you cut off the chaperones, or are, are, are as many parents welcome? Um, well, so we can only take as much as we can fit on a bus, and there's, I believe, 55 can fit on a bus. I've never had a trip that big before, but I, anything could happen. Um, so usually what I do is, um, I let the students sign up first and once they make that first payment and we see how many are actually ready to commit, then whatever spots are left, we do like, a um, we draw out of a hat essentially. So, um, all the activities are culturally based and linked to our national, um, foreign language standards. Um, and the tour guides are obviously all trained and certified in CPR and first aid. They speak both Spanish and English, but we really speak a lot of Spanish there. We try not to speak a lot of English. Um, we do have community service projects planned, which I'm really excited about because of COVID. The last two trips, we haven't been able to do any community service. Everything was shut down, um, but we are going to be doing some service. Um, there may be some planting of trees. There's a town there um, that's really artistic, and in order to save the town, they've painted the entire town with murals, and it's gorgeous. But because pe so many people go there for social media, for pictures and things, the murals get damaged by people touching them. So one way that we can help is that the, the company buys all, supplies all the tools and the paint, and the kids help paint and clean the murals. Um, and the kids love going there. It's all over. If you've seen any of our pictures from the last two trips, it's like all over their social media. Yauco, Yauco. It's really cool. Um, in fact, I think I have a picture in here. So we here's some of our activities on top of the community service. We do, um, obviously, water sports, kayaking, banana boats. There's a catamaran. We charter a catamaran one day. Um, we go snorkeling. We go hiking in El Yunque in the rainforest. Um, we have a live fisherman show. He catches all kinds of sea creatures that they've never seen before, and they actually get to hold them, like put an octopus on their face. And it's just, a, it's really fun. Um, we also go to the bioluminescent bay. If you've ever heard of that, the kids get to swim, and the water actually glows. It's a natural um, phenomenon there. Um, they also get to learn how to salsa dance, which I never really thought my high schoolers would love, but they, they do. They really get into it. Um, and then, uh, obviously, we tour some historic forts. We go to El Moro in San Juan. So there's just a map of where we stay. We normally stay. Um, the capital is up in the top right-hand corner. We normally stay a day or two in Fajardo. We don't stay in any big, major um, cities. We stay in all small, local, um, Puerto Rican-owned so that we support local. But also because we're not in big cities, if kids were to get an idea to sneak out, there's really nowhere for them to go. So that makes me feel a little better chaperoning. <laughs> um, so the cost is based on the number of paying participants, obviously. And obviously, with the economy being what it is, it is significantly more this year than it has been in the past. I can't control airline prices. I can't control fuel prices. I mean, it just is what it is. But it's inclu it includes their airfare, their hotel. Um, students are housed four to a room and adults are two to a room. Um, travel insurance is optional and is extra if they want. Um, it includes their entrance for all events, their ground transport. We have a bus with us at all times. And then we also have a personal guide and a personal vehicle. So should we have an accident or somebody get hurt, we have a way for to send the group on their trip and I go with the student to take care of whatever the situation is. And that does cover two meals per day. So they only have to pay for one meal. The cost is approximately $2,500.
right now they quoted us for um, 40 to 49 travelers. And then the two free would be myself and Nancy, obviously. Um, right now, like I said, I have approximately 45 and approximately seven to 10 parents. And then two staff members, myself and Nancy would be. Um, just real quick, why Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the U.S. Um, it's super safe. It's just like being in another state. It's like being in Florida, except everything's in Spanish and English. Um, you don't have to have a passport. They take American currency. Um, all their medical facilities are all up to our what our typical standards. Um, it's more affordable than a lot of the other trips. And their cell phones all work, which is very important when you're 17 years old. You must have your social media, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here are some pictures from the past. <clears throat> this was the year after Hurricane Maria, and we went to restore a, a community center. Excuse me. <clears throat> and there's just some more pictures of that. Can you scroll down to the next one? <clears throat> Here's that town I was talking about. Yauco. So that's where we'll be, we will be doing our community service. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so voting for the Puerto Rico trip. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. All right, motion passed. <laughs> Item E, school safety. Uh, Officer Shippacassi and Officer Corey uh, and August, Mr. Ost, uh, to approve the recommendation to utilize ACAP solutions to provide an expert independent review of school processes and make suggestions on areas that need to be improved. The cost of $8,000 is fully reimbursable through the safety grant. Never have two people been more happy to see August. No, they're not even coming up they here. They didn't have to present today. So. <laughs> One reason to be here tonight and they won't even get up. No. Um, I first, I apologize. I missed administrative moments. I normally love standing in front of you and telling you all the good things that are happening. So I'm glad that we get around two where I get to get up and at least talk. So American or assessment preparation and resources, uh, Officer Shippacassi, Officer Corey and I, we've done a lot of work on this this year. The grant was actually due back in October. It was a four part grant where three of the parts was really about safety and security in schools. Uh, the one we're specifically talking about right now is 97 C. Um, the state offered $2,000 per building. So Riverside Elementary, Middle High School, $8,000 total. Dollars, and they'll come in, the company we're recommending tonight, um, ATAP, American Threat and or Threat Assessment and Protection, uh, more of a local company. They'll come in and run through a whole process of inf a whole process they put together to, to do our security assessments. So we did put together a presentation. It has a lot, a lot on it that you can really read through on your own. But what we wanted to emphasize is that we we talked to two of them. We talked to ATAP and we talked to SEC, Secure Educational uh, Consultants, I believe is that what that acronym stands for. Um, we really liked ATAP because they involve, they involve the community. They involve our school staff. Um, we're going to be getting together to put together a focus group that will be made up of community members. Um, following this meeting later this week, we'll be reaching out via social media to see if we can find out who's interested. Uh, we at least want one parent from each building. We want at least three community members, and then there'll be school staff. So the, the, the focus team, it's not driven by decision makers, our normal decision makers that are, that are in the building every day. Uh, we really want to hear from the outside. We want to hear from parents. What are their concerns? What's the community members' concerns? What are our teachers' concerns, our paraprofessionals? Just the whole gamut so we know what we can do. So on there, uh, if you can go, Mr. Litchford, to what does our partnership include, just kind of gives one more. So this is a breakdown, and we again, I won't read them all to you, but they're going to evaluate everything we currently have in place. Um, they're going to assist us in making improvements so we can just do a better job making sure we're as secure as possible. 
And we really, again, I'm going to emphasize, we really like the idea. They're going to be with us every step of the way. They're going to start with the focus team. Then I want to make sure I word this right. They're going to start with the focus team, and then they're going to move on to a, a safety council. Then we're going to create a, a safety team. And every time we, we move up a layer there, it gets a little bit smaller, and we get back to the buildings and, and make sure we're carrying out the recommendations that they're making. So another part of the grant is 97. There's 97, 97C, 97D. So the cool thing that the state did is they gave us $8,000 to do the evaluation of our, of our buildings. But then our district, we were awarded, uh, the award notification came last week. Um, we, we were awarded $210,061 to actually act upon the recommendations through the security assessment. So that'll be something that that money has to go hand in hand with the assessment. So we are, we can't decide right now how we're going to spend that $210,000. we will complete this process. We'll start that in March. And then at some point later this year, as that, as that trickles out, we'll be in the plans of, of making those improvements. The other thing, the other component of the grant is 97D. Um, you'll start hearing us talk about 97D a little more as we move forward. That's critical incident mapping. So we already have our building maps, but we'll have a company coming in. We were awarded $15,000 from the state to do our critical incident mapping, which is very very high in-depth mapping of our school and our school, our school grounds, our school facilities. So the only other part, and we won't bore you with all the grant talk all the time, but the last part, it was a four-part grant. 31AA is another one, uh, just a, a focus on student mental health. Um, our district was awarded two, just under $208,000 for that component of the grant. So about a half a million total in that grant. We're excited to have those grant notifications come through and just keep the process moving forward. So questions? Uh, Mr. Ost, you've given us um, the uh, some numbers for grants that you've received, but like for instance, the fifteen thousand for the critical incident mapping. How much does that critical? So part of the no good question. Fifteen thousand. Okay. And so then the two thousand dollars per insurance that'll be eight thousand. So the way that the, a lot of the companies like ATAP, for example, they know that it's not just Gundy, it's Ida, it's Jefferson, whoever applied for this grant. For the safety assessment, it's it's a flat two thousand dollars per building, no matter how big or how small you are. So companies oftentimes will charge more than that if we were contracting with them to come in. But because they know that we're getting two thousand and there's that direct turnaround through ninety seven C, they're all charging two thousand. So the companies have been great. I was a little worried that the elementary and middle school might be considered one building because we're all technically in this one building, we're one site, but we were awarded another one. But both SEC, the the first company we talked to, and ATAP. They both, if we only got 6,000, they were going to charge 6,000. So that's the way the companies work that. And then critical incident mapping, um, secure, I forget the name, critical, um, I forget the name that we're going to be working with, or at least the first one I talked to. You had to have a price to actually apply for the grant. So we reached out for one just to make sure that whatever we were asking for was going to be enough to get the job done. But now that we have the money, we can just shop around a little bit, make sure we're getting the best value. And I have a feeling it's going to be similar, though, where, where everybody's charging about the same amount. And the 210000 to act upon the assessment, do you know typically what a school, what it would cost for a school to act on their assessment? I think it depends on how much they have in place. So we have a lot of things already going in here. Like in the 2018 bond, we got new doors in the elementary school. Um, schools that maybe have not had that luxury, um, they're going to probably have more recommendations on things like that that we've been able to get ahead of. Um, I know we have light night locks in some areas, which is like a, a lockdown mechanism um, just to secure the doors. So it really depends on what we have, and it's different from school to school. Yeah, Thank good you. question. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow up as uh, you can bet that 210000 will be spent and we'll have some other things that need to be done eventually. But in the governor's at least initial proposal, there was additional funds for – um, 318 million actually for safety, school safety. So my guess is it will carry over that, you know, up continuing to use this assessment and as our blueprint for how to improve the safety of the schools. Anything else? I want to thank Officer Corey and Officer Shippa Cassie for your support tonight, and uh, we'll keep you updated as we move forward with this. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so item E, the school safety. Uh, I need a motion and a second. Support. All right. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those pillows nay. Motion passed. Uh, item F, the budget amendment. 
to approve the 2022-2023 budget amendment as presented. I'll need a motion a second, and this action will need to be voted on uh, by roll call. Yeah, I think uh, we will have some presentation. So when okay. during discussion, most likely we'll, if you want to. All right, so can I get a motion first? Is there a pre, I'm sorry, is there a presentation yeah. first or are we doing approving it? We first? can do it first. If oh, you okay, want. okay. Um, Sharon, motion. would you like to? Yeah, let's up? let's hear the presentation okay. first, and then that way we can. If there's discussion, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Is this working all right? Okay. So I'm seeing numbers in my sleep now because there is a lot going on in this district. And a lot of it is because of the COVID monies that we have received in the last three years. And that meant that, that there was an influx of monies into our general fund budget. Now that some of those, half of them are closed out, we're spending the rest of those now. And we'll have the rest of them probably closed out by September of this year, which will mean next year's budget will look much different again because the numbers will go down. So I've been going through this and working on this for a couple of weeks and more as I've been having meetings with directors and principals. And in this process, I have, um, would like you, some of you have already met my replacement for, upon my retirement is Kim Worden, and she comes to us from the ISD as a shared services business manager. And I can tell you her years of experience speak volumes, and she's currently been working at a Monroe County school. So her knowledge of what we do here in Monroe County and how we handle things has been such an asset. And she's very intelligent and capable. And I feel so much better about retiring because I know that Kim is going to just take the reins and not miss a beat. So I've enjoyed working with her. She does have a good sense of humor because sometimes we have to when we think about these numbers. So it's been nice. She's been, of course, training her replacement first before she comes over uh, full time. But she's been able to come in a day to her day or two here and there just to sort of get involved a little bit in this budget and see what Dundee is about, even though she has many of the same grants that we've had of, at her school. So it's been kind of nice having a comrade uh, to talk to. So as we go through this, I just wanted to remind you, I've always say this, that a budget is a living, breathing document. And so I want to thank Kim too for listening to me through all of this. <laughs> She's been great. And so as soon as this budget was completed, the very next day we heard of more information, which was about the grants that Mr. Ost just talked about. So now we can incorporate those new things into this grant. And certain things that come about, repairs that need to be made, there's always something happening every day. So as we went through this, I was explaining that we have a starting point then we have a mid-year update, which is what we're doing here. And there will be a final budget adjustment that comes that we're, where we can really right-size things. And by we, I'll do some preliminary work, but Kim will be in charge of handling that final budget um, amendment. And also for the new year. And like I said, it will look much different because we have different funding sources and different funding things happening, happening for next year. One thing that you may notice in your board book, there was a summary sheet there, and we have over 2,000 individual accounts, account codes on our ledger. So we summarize it in the state categories that they assign us. So the very first thing you will notice is in the new year budget that we were presented, that I presented last summer, there was a particular uh, fund balance that we thought we would start with 2.8 million. After the audit, that was uh, adjusted because it ended up being 2.2 million. Major difference there being things that were paid a timing issue, things that we thought 
may take place in July. They took place in June. So then we had to move those forward and those were accrued back into last year. So that reduced our fund balance. So that was a timing issue on that as far as mostly was for the capital projects. And then in the very first line, you'll see under revenue, there are four categories, local, state, federal, and incoming transfers and other. In that first line item, here's where we project what our property tax income will be from the five different townships that we have. So with the property values going up and there's a difference there than projected, this comes right off of our state aid note uh, our state aid status report that will tell us exactly how much we can anticipate in our assumed revenue for local tax, that being $3.3 million. You'll see the federal monies had not changed very much from what we thought we would have is what we would thought it was very close to what we still project to have. Then their federal monies, these are the grants. Some of the grants that we received now we have ESSER three monies, and we can have that included in our revenue. And I'll show you in the expenditure section where that will be spent. And the last item, the incoming transfers, we did have a notice from the Intermediate School District that our uh, updated numbers from our tech millage and also our special ed payments. So we were able to update that based on the information we have received. So at the end, our revenues are projected to be 22. 9 million. If you look in the expenditure section then, you'll see that in the salaries section for the basic programs and the second line for added needs special education. So here is where there's a shift here where we had been spending a lot of our COVID monies for capital projects, things such as the desk shields and the gloves and the masks and those types of things. Now we're shifting it to where we're able to use that for um, in instructional type things where we need more hours there and more in um, programs for our children to make sure that we're having our education, we're not missing a beat on the things over the COVID years. So we had to adjust for that and also another um, wonderful thing that we have has already been mentioned, our additional CTE programs. We have four new programs this year, and those um, salaries and benefits are in there for those teachers. Along with the equipment, we were awarded $115,000 for equipment for those new programs. So that, that we'll see in there. The next line item is very close. We did have funding for our social worker. And the way the state designed that is that it started out at 100% and it will gradually decrease. Um, and then we will lo look at other funding sources, either that'll be other grants that we can replace that with or general fund dollars. But our first choice is the other grants. <coughs> Excuse me, I felt that tickle coming on. <laughs> Um, the other items I would mention are in the operations and maintenance area. And here's where I was mentioning that along with the fact that we were able to reduce the four additional custodians we were contracting for due to COVID cleaning, now that we are not needing that this year. Also, we had the portable lease payment that came in that we'll be having uh, until we get our new classrooms in place. We have additional space, and also our installment payment on our long-term general ob obligation bond. But a lot of the monies that we spent for COVID grants have now been shifted up to other areas. Another thing to note is on transportation. We do have in this budget to purchase one new additional special education bus. It's much needed. Talk to um, Mrs. Kress about this, and it's something that she's been has made us aware of over the last couple of years. And it's really time now that that special ed, ed bus is needed. And also we had our uh, annual increase per the bid that we had from our custodial service vendor. 
And then also just a to touch point on the outgoing transfers. That looks approximately the same as last year, but just to note that we did include $50,000 in there for the turf maintenance. <coughs> Pardon me. And the $300,000 for the capital improvements fund. So this is for um, things to set aside <clears throat> in case we have a major repair. Therefore, our total expenditures are $23.4 million. Leaves us with a fund balance of $1.7 million, which is 7.76%. Again, this is something that we will still be working on as we go through the year. We find out new things all the time, as I mentioned. Uh, this can improve if, if expenditures come in lower than what we anticipate or if we have additional funding that comes in. We'll be working with Mr. Leach and other di uh, district administrators uh, in the coming days. And just wanted to mention to you that, <coughs> excuse me, thank you, I'll take that water. Pardon me, just a moment. Almost to the end and then it started. So these are things that we can still be keeping an eye on. And uh, like I said, when we do the final budget amendment, then that's when we're able to more right size these numbers. I apologize for the tickle. Anybody got any questions? I just had one question. I'm sorry. All right. So we've got these CTE courses. Um, does Do we get any money for the students that come from out of district to contribute towards that? <clears throat> yes, we do. We have received money through the intermediate school district. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're Turf maintenance, that's a one time thing, correct? In case we need it, or is it? That's yearly. It's a yearly <clears throat> installment plan that in 10 to 15 years, when the turf wears out, we have the money to replace it. Is that okay? That's what I understand. Yeah. So it's not going to cost us $50,000 a year for turf maintenance. No, it's, it's, it's putting in a uh, basically an emergency it? fund, a replacement okay. fund. So every year, we'll have it $50,000, and then when it's time for the turf to be replaced, you will have the money, you have the cash to pay for it. It's like a savings account. I see. To pay for the turf. Okay, I get it. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any uh, further discussion for the budget amendment? All right. Uh, what we'll need a roll call vote for this? We need a motion first. Per oh, I'm sorry. Yep. We started that, didn't we? Okay. Uh, motion to approve uh, the 2022 2023 budget amendment as presented. I need a motion and a second. Motion. All right. Roll call. Pat Modelinski? Yes. yes. Okay. So Keith Pilbeam? Yep. Keith yes. Pilbeam? Yes. Kim Wilkins? Yes. Christian Freshour? Yes. Tara McKenzie? Yes. Crystal Root? Yes. JC Carner? Yes. All right. Motion passes. Item G Commissioning Services. Uh, to approve GMB to provide commissioning services for the upcoming summer. 23 HVAC work in the elementary and middle school, along with the elementary addition and cafeteria expansion that will be completed during the summer of 2024 as presented. I need a motion and a second. Support. Any discussion? Yeah, like that. So this will take care of these two years then? This will take care of, my understanding is, everything but perhaps the pool 
renovations that have to occur. So this is all the HVACs that will be done this summer, which are 46 units. And then also the new addition to the uh, elementary, that whole wing, and, there's one, and the cafeteria expansion, the elementary cafeteria expansion, also includes this cafeteria expansion. Okay. For does, renovation. Does that include the both gyms? Both gyms. Yeah. Cooling for no. Okay. So the the commission is just for the uh, the new bills and the new installs. Like for last year. Last year, yeah. Yeah, they come in independently, go through everything, make sure everything was installed for the plans and specs, make sure all the controls are operating they're supposed to. Just like a, a third party check to make sure everything's copacetic. Are are they putting these type units in the new wing? I don't know. That's a great question. I'm assuming so because our bid um, when we when we made our decision was to go stick with the same um, units, but I don't know if we've gotten that far yet in purchasing those okay. units, to be honest. I, I know we haven't, actually, because they won't roll in until next summer where those would be put in. They'll start the creation of the wing, but not the purchasing of that stuff hasn't occurred yet. Good question. Uh, one more question. Um, are we going to have timelines on each part of these construction projects? We have goals at this moment for the um, the middle school kitchen and the 46 units to be done before the start of the next school year. Similar timeline to what we did over this past summer. Um, the, the minute uh, they get secured, I think in March or April, um, the units do, and then they will be ready to start moving in and doing work the day after the students exit the school year. When is the station for the wing to be completed, that, the elementary wing? The goal at this point would be for the start of the, let me get this right, this is 22, 23, 23, 24. So it'd be the start of the 24, 25 school okay. year is our goal. So they'll start construction. Construction will be going on all next year for that wing in the hopes that it's completed for the start of that next school year. Okay. Yeah. So the goal is to have everything completed by the start of 2024 school year. For the wing. For the wing. Yeah, we haven't even started talking about pool renovations yet. So. But the addition to the. Yes, the addition. That, that the portable school. will hopefully be gone. Okay. And that cost gone, and we will be um, opening a new wing. 24, 25. 24, 25. You got, you got Hudson coming, so. I'm sorry? You got my little one coming, <laughs> so. Yep. So we're it, all we're, in here, so. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? I apologize for the, the tardiness on this. They gave it to us right at the end of last board meeting. I said no, and then I forgot about it. So I apologize. I did do my due diligence. Um, the last commission was $10,000. That was only 26 units. This is 46 with the addition of the kitchen here, the and the wing and the expansion of the cafeteria. Um, and it is typical to have your designers be a third party because they're the ones that kind of drew it up and they're the ones then would you know know exactly what we were expecting. So I, I did ask some questions. Um, do my due diligence, so I, I think it is a, a fair and, and competitive bid. Yep. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. And on to superintendent comments. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just how exciting that our kids get to go to Puerto Rico if they so choose. That's absolutely amazing. I'll be praying that your name's pulled, Crystal. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, a couple updates. Uh, the governor has released uh, her budget for next year. Now, I understand the process. She releases it. The House and the Senate release theirs. They all work together, and we somehow come out in the middle. Uh, being that they're both the House and the Senate are Democratic-run, 
you know it's going to kind of fall in the same spot. So the good news is, is at this point, the governor's budget is $458 per pupil increase. So that's some good news for us. Um, our numbers are somewhere down here. I have our student count. We actually grew six students from the fall to the um, spring. So, you know, we're, um, as tight as our fund balance is going to be projected at this time, um, tightening up a little bit here, there, making some small choices in the immediate will pay off and get us back to a healthy thing. I can't, you know, we did have some one-time costs that ate into our fund balance, um, but they were uh, necessary. The parking lot was one of them. Um, and I can't remember what the other one was off the top of my head. Now I should, but what was the other? Yeah, yeah. The uh, paying for the additional, we leveraged our ESSER money to get the uh, the vertical unit vents in the upstairs. But we still we ran out of ESSER money, so we had to participate. Our our general fund had to give some of that too. So worthy though, because at the end of this summer, we'll be uh, air conditioned all the classrooms, which is awesome. Um, and for many years will be in good shape, I think, in that respect. Um, let me see, additional special ed, there's uh, in the horizon two uh, at risk fund. So those will, all these things will will come into play later on. We'll find out more. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, uh, you are really educatedly guessing at that budget that we'll adopt in June. You're guessing, you know, hopefully by that time, the House and the Senate and the governor have all agreed on the per pupil amount. That's one factor. Then we, we estimate how many students we'll have. That's a second factor. And then, uh, you know, we find out more. So it's uh, not a perfect science. Whoever thought the schools had to submit a budget without really knowing their information, uh, they probably having a laugh at us here. Um, there is a, there, the governor is talking about expanding a great start readiness program to all families, kind of be a phase in. We'll see if that passes. Um, that would be an amazing thing. I, my time's gone, but that would be amazing for families. Uh, she's also talking about free breakfast and lunch for all students, which would benefit us greatly um, because that would be uh, at, you know, all of a sudden now food service is all about turning over meals. And the more meals you sell, the, the bigger the profit. And obviously, um, then we can invest in different things in the cafeteria. You have to keep it within food service, but it would go towards salaries that, you know, making that uh, break even or even save some money. We might be able to get some new tables or chairs or um, equipment. So it's kind of exciting stuff if that passed. Uh, that could shift some bond money a little bit, knowing that we are going to be growing that fund balance in the food service we might be able to do a couple expansions on certain things where we had to cut back. Everything's about how much is it going to cost and what can we afford? So, you know, that could be a, a nice thing for us to uh, maybe get back to some of the bond things that we trimmed up a little bit. Um, let me see, th uh, 38, 318 million for school safety. As I mentioned, it's going to be tied to that assessment. We already know we're getting 200,000, but I'm, I'm sure, um, I, I got to think they're thinking ahead and they're like, you got to get this done. And then you continue to pay for that. If you remember when I first got here, an assessment is great, but if they don't give you money to, to do the things you need to do, it's useless. Well, they're coming through with that too. So that's, that's great. Uh, and, uh, that 200 and I forget thousand, uh, thousand dollars will, will go quickly. Uh, it's security is not, uh, cheap, but it's, it's important. Um, I did hear too, that she's going to try to get a, 900 million dollar rainy day fund for the schools so we'll see if that happens that would only be like a, I don't know five percent of the entire budget but it's good they're looking a little ahead too um with our amended budget and i think in our contract i see lee out there we're gonna have to start negotiations soon i think i was told today that by march 1st we have to start the, the negotiations i didn't even know schools have a deadlines to start the negotiations but that was i learned something new today lee so we've got to get going on that one um so we, i think that's one thing we're going to have to solidify our negotiation team moving forward and then set up some times to meet with the dea um as you if you hadn't heard that uh the state of michigan had some swatting which is like a cyber threat that's 
done through the internet. Uh, we were fortunate. We were not one of the districts that received the SWAT this time, uh, but there were some other districts further north. Um, and uh, so it caused a stir and uh, just got to, uh, everyone not panic too much, uh, do go through the routine. That's part of these security things is to make it a routine so that when something does happen, we, we shift into a comfort zone where you just do what you got to do. Kind of like fire drills, you know, I mean, uh, fire drills actually do work. You desensitize kids to not get scared by it and they just, they walk outside and then, you know, they're safe. So we just got to continue to work on this process uh, as schools. Um, we were, unfortunately, we had a spam attack recently that was going on, uh, but, you know, it's some new challenge every single time. Uh, let me see here. I'm trying to read my handwriting. We have an audit for our school, school nutrition program on uh, starting on March 17th. And actually, Krista was meeting with the individual today. They'll make their on-site visit um, on the 18th and 19th of, of April. And actually, it's the Dundee Middle School. So they're going to be watching, making sure we're serving the right stuff. That big, it's a big audit, but it, it's we're ready for it. We've known about it for a while. As I mentioned, we increased uh, seven students in our count, which is awesome. Our GSRP, which was we weren't quite full, we're of 17 of 18 slots, so we're darn close. And then Head Start, we're 17 of 17, so we're full there. That's some good news. Um, well, uh, some interesting stuff here at the high school. One of the first things that got brought up to me was about a therapy dog, um, you know, a, a dog that can calm a kid down if they're having trouble, heck, even an adult, I'll tell you that. And, uh, I, you know, I thought it'd be a great idea, um, maybe one at each building someday. Well, we have uh, Nancy Charbonneau has a dog, a doodle, that has been trained in it. And um, so we're looking into what the process would be to, uh, have a therapy dog. I think it'd probably be a step for the board to approve. Um, there would be certification. SETSAG has said they don't like to insure it, so we'd probably have to get a third-party insurance company. Um, I believe our Farmers Bureau has a dog <coughs> under um, insurance, right, for a school? Yeah. My sister-in-law has the same thing at her school, and so we took care of that for her. Yeah, yeah it's a so liability. I just think the benefits <laughs> outweigh any uh, questions or anything. I think it's an awesome thing. Any, I've never been lucky enough. I hear about stories about how schools had these dogs that would, you know, roam around. I've never been fortunate enough. I just know you see a dog and they're just happy to see you. And they really do a kid's having a bad day and that dog can just bring them down and, and get them to relax. Same for adults. I can't wait. I'm, I'm so they can bring it to my room any day of the week. I love dogs. I'm, I live in an apartment, so it's not fair to have one. So I'd love, but I just give you the heads up. We're starting that process, looking into it. And uh, uh, I'll give you more information. So don't be surprised by that. Um, committee assignments. I think we, we, we need to get going on those. One of them uh, will be the uh, uh, personnel and finance committee. Uh, within there is our negotiation team. And then we also have our facility and maintenance, which is going to uh, look over the bond stuff a little bit more and then make walkthroughs of our facility to uh, then uh, help us prioritize after bond <laughs> spending is done. And then we get back to the normal maintenance and stuff. And finally, um, hats off to Tom in August. Is August still here? Mm -hmm. Head out. No. Um, they are working on our new website, Aptigy. And it's also it's an app and it's a website. So eventually I'll have we'll have a day where we all download the app for free. And you know, then you you would log in and it's it will really mainstream communication between uh, the app, which is called uh, live feed, right? Is that what it is? The yeah, they're new. But then you, you can send it to the app. You can send it to Twitter. You can send it to Facebook. So social posts. Um, we will. It's it's like our website, but in an app format. And it will. It I had it at Vandercook, and when I got here, and they said that they were looking at it. Uh, 
Dundee had looked at it. Was it, it was a, a chunk to invest in, but I just know that uh, the positive impact it had on our school district and promoting the district was uh, worth every dime of, of our goals for me was communication, and I think it will increase communication uh, to our community. I'm real excited about it, and I think August is too, and I think everyone is. So just uh, that's getting up and running. I'm actually on the back end. We're starting to fill it with posts that are for Twitter, Facebook, and the app. So then when we go live, we actually have some feed stuff on there already and um, real excited about it. So do we have a timeline when it's going to go live? Spring break. Okay, there you go. Spring break. So what, what's real cool is eventually uh, you can empower kids to take a picture. They'd send it to their advisor or their principal and if it's appropriate you can shoot it out on facebook so you get an idea for student life you can really expand it as much as you want or you can narrow it uh, i'm kind of a share of the the uh the sharing of the great stuff that goes on in a school so i always let my principals i'll be honest like they were on pretty tight lockdown and eddie wanted to approve everything and i just i'm kind of uh Let's let's get stuff posted. We're doing so many amazing things in the classrooms. Uh, we want people to see it and, and hear about it. So that's all I have. It will. It, it is. Uh, it's also can serve as our instant alert or whatever you want to call it. So yes, that's a part of it too, um, and and it's easy to get into. So yes, that's another piece of it. Yep, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, any board comments? I just want to say uh, Tara and I went to the school safety seminar last week. Very informational. Very good, I thought. So I was impressed with that. So just thanks to the ISD for putting that on. Really good food, too. <laughs> Anything else? All right. We are done. Motion. motion to adjourn. Need a motion. Sorry, newbie mistake again. Uh, motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion. Second. All set. Aye. All those in favor say aye. All in favor aye. say aye. All right. Thank there you. There you go. <laughs> Have a great job. On the fly.